Let's give a very warm welcome to uh, Dr. David Rock. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's a wonderful uh, welcome, and I, I'm glad I didn't know that there was a hockey game on tonight. I would have been really anxious for the last few days about was anyone going to show up, but um, I'm delighted that you have, although I, I'm noticing the ratio of male to female is a little interesting this evening. So thank you for coming out. There we go. Thank you. I appreciate that. There's a couple here. Thank you for being here. So we're going to talk about organizational change. Um, you know, change is, is hard, as you know. Personal change is really tricky. Organizational change is kind of off the charts, isn't it, in terms of degree of difficulty. Um, they're complex and chaotic, uh, although organizations are, of course, collections of individuals. And I, my understanding is as we understand individual change better, we get amazing insights into organizational change. So I'm going to be talking you know, a little bit about both. I guess my emphasis is on kind of how brains change. And what is it that creates the right state for brains to change? And then, and then exploring how does that work on a systemic scale? Because organizations are groups of, of, of brains. And one of the things that uh, I realized a few years ago uh, is that you know, work today is really can be categorized in many ways, but can be categorized in two ways. If you're a fly on the wall and the sound was off in any office, you'd basically see people doing two things. And it's quite odd, really. Uh, they're not chopping wood or you know, fetching water. Some people are you know, putting the the water back into the, uh, you know, the, the cooler or something once in a while. But mostly, you know, if you're flying the wall and the sound's off, what are you seeing? You're seeing people thinking and people trying to share their thinking in order to influence other people's thinking. You notice that? Like we're either thinking or we're, you know, we're speaking through our mouths, through our fingers, through other ways to try to actually influence other people's thinking. And so much of the work now is literally just, you know, thinking work, more than knowledge work, think, thinking work. And so I think the, the, um, the, you know, the, the brain research is a really useful construct for getting into uh, you know, thinking about organizational change, because the work is about, is about thinking itself. OK, um, one of the, you know, we're at a really interesting time. We're at a really interesting time with uh, research. And I'm very, very honored to have um, kind of uh, you know, found something, um, I guess, important to me. But uh, you know, the, the growth of neuro leadership in the field and the institute in many ways is a function of the research suddenly being available um, and the technology being available. And there's been, been this huge breakthrough in really two things, computing power, because you know, an, fMRI has, an fMRI has just masses of data uh, to, to process. So computing power and actual technology like fMRI. And, and the third, uh, the third or innovation that's happened in the world is GE has got very good at selling fMRIs to <laughs> to universities and medical centers around the world. So they're everywhere now. Uh, but putting that aside, there's this amazing breakthrough in, in research. And um, we're finding things out that we just, you know, every month, if not every week, that we couldn't have found out even, you know, five years ago and certainly 10 years ago. And science has this interesting way of sort of evolving. You know, you think things are one way, and then suddenly it all changes. You know, we think that the Earth is flat. We discover it's not. Uh, we think that it's uh, perfectly OK to uh, smoke. <laughs> Actually, I was at Fraser Health this morning. This was quite poignant to them, a lot of people in white coats. Um, we think it's OK to smoke, and we find out later maybe it's not so good. Uh, we think that it's OK to uh, maybe drink cola. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful one? For a better start in life, start cola earlier. Um, you know, we think these things are OK, and then science finds out that it's, you know, it's, it's not so good. And I think we're at this, actu this really interesting point where in just five to 10 years, we're actually going to look back on organizational change strategies and leadership development strategies and be quite embarrassed, uh, to be honest. We're going to be quite embarrassed about some of the things that we do. And we're going to look back and say, wow, we were doing that stuff. That's amazing. You know, like, gosh, we really know that's a terrible idea. Uh, oh, my goodness. Um, and maybe at the end of the night, we'll talk about what some of those things might be. Um, but I think we're, we're at that point. So the Institute, just to give you a bit of the story and sort of the context, um, in, 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 uh, in 2007, we ran the first neuroleadership uh, summit. And, and sort of how it came about was I wrote a paper called The Neuroscience of Leadership. Um, has anyone read that? Who's, who's read The Neuroscience of Leadership? Lots of people. Great. Um, the, uh, the paper uh, sort of just put forward the idea that it's important to think about leadership from a neuroscience perspective and gave some of the, the foundations. But this interesting thing happened 
uh, after I wrote the paper is that a, a business school wrote to me and they said, uh, you know, we really, uh, we really need your help to create uh, leaders rather than analysts uh, when we're doing our MBA program. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting, you know, taking young people and, and sort of doing better with them. That's, that's very honorable. I said, well, what, you know, what are you doing? They said, well, we're taking these young people, you know, undergrads and MBAs, and we're trying to do really deep personal transformation work with them because they basically come out, you know, when, when they come to us, they come out with um, no self-awareness and, 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 you know, terrible social skills and, you know, really poor ability to, you know, be leaders. And, and we're supposed to fill them with accounting knowledge and suddenly send them out to be CEOs. Um, and he, he said, this is a very passionate guy who's on the other end of the phone, and he said, you know, we, we actually decided we're going to create leaders. So we're doing these really deep transformational programs that we sort of found from some people. But the, the, the university's up in arms about it because we have no theory. And uh, you can't teach anything without a theory at university. And uh, he said, you know, we really found that the neuroscience is, is a fantastic way of, uh, of underpinning and explaining, not just sort of pushing it away, but actually explaining thoroughly, robustly, you know, what we were doing in the leadership programs. And he says, we really need your help to, to, to kind of build this. And, and we've sort of made your paper the you know, underpinning of our whole MBA program, which really scared me, to be honest, because it's 6,000 words. And <laughs> I'm, I was very concerned suddenly about what they were talking about. But anyway, he said, you know, we really need your help. Can you come and help us? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, we're just near Venice in Italy. And I said, you know what, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my, suddenly opened my calendar and anyway, Cut a long story short, we were th I was there and um, uh, while I, I, over dinner, uh, um, the, the, the professor there, the dean there said, you know, we're really serious about this. And I said, well, if you're serious about this, we need to get a group of people together. We need to get the neuroscientists who are really inter interesting and important in, in this field and get some, you know, and maybe we'll get some, maybe we'll get an audience of leadership people um, to sort of pay for the neuroscientists. But, if we could just get the neuroscientists together, we could start kind of building a field. You know, if we could get the guy that's studying attention with the guy who's studying insight, with the guy who's doing social cognitive work, and the guy who's doing expectations work, and the guy kind of, it'd be really, really interesting. Anyway, uh, it was a great lesson in, in just how incredibly wrong I can be. Um, and, you know, I, I make more mistakes than most people that I know. Um, I just recover and move on. Um, but it was an incredible mistake in many ways, that first conference, because I was completely, utterly wrong about uh, getting neuroscientists together. Not only did they not want to talk to each other, but on the first night of the summit, of the first summit, we actually like, had to physically separate some of them. Um, <laughs> I, I'm serious. And we were like, oh my God, is this, is this summit going to go on or, or what? It was, I wish we'd made the movie about the, the making of the first <laughs> summit. I mean, they're really like, like you know, a, a, a Protestant and Catholic priest in a certain sense or a Sunni and, and, and Shiite Muslim, too close and too, too competitive, you know? And um, anyways, the whole theory of that. But cut a long story short, what the, the neuroscience, it was a terrible idea getting neuroscientists, but there was this unexpected, amazing idea in getting leadership people with the neuroscientists, and everyone started connecting there. And this surprising thing happened was, kind of it got picked up as a field, and the media picked it up, and we started to, you know, we, we really did found a field at that first summit. In two but cut a long story short, we, um, we ran this first summit and, um, uh, and, and suddenly we, you know, we saw something was important and I started to get just emails every single week from people saying, you know, I felt like I've been out in the wilderness all this time and now I've like found a home and, you know, thank you, thank you. And we started to, to kind of, we saw something was there. So the institute now um, is a global institute, uh, the headquarters of it, um, really it's in, in, in New York we have one, of, you know, kind of a satellite headquarters, but in Sydney we have the largest uh, team running the back end. Uh, the academic programs, postgraduate and masters, there's, uh, there's well, we're coming up close to 200 students from about um, 40 different countries who are doing that. Um, and the, we're up to our sixth uh, summit and our third journal just came out. And we think out of the 30 or so papers we've published, about 20 to 25 of those we think are really breakthrough papers that um, could have tremendous uh, impact in the field. For example, uh, we ex we've explained actually how you do uh, give feedback in ways that work, as opposed to currently 40% of all feedback interventions actually make things worse, um, which is the highest percentage, by the way. The next percentage is 30% do nothing. So, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, really difficult issues like how do you actually give feedback so it changes behavior? And how do you actually do learning so it sticks in the brain? Um, and how do you measure and manage engagement in a way that has real data behind it? 